Alors, bonjour, bonjour et à, à toutes et à tous. Euh, je suis Benoît Jodoin, responsable des activités culturelles. Donc, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette conversation qui est organisée par le Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal autour de l'exposition Parallèle, une autre histoire du design. Une exposition, donc, euh, euh, commissariée par Jennifer Laurent, qui est conservatrice aux arts décoratifs et au design ici au musée. Euh, L'exposition est donc présentée jusqu'au 28 mai. Hello and welcome to this conversation hosted by the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and organized around Parallel, a history of women in design, an exhibition curated by Jennifer Laurent, curator of decorative arts and design at the MMFA. Uh, that exhibition is presented at the museum until May 28th. So today, this is the first edition of our series, Lunch and Chat with a Designer. Um, it is hosted by our chief curator, uh, Marie-Béry Desmarais. Hi, Marie. I will uh, host the converse and she will host the conversation with uh, Laura Willey-Lac, whose work is featured in the exhibition. But before we start, I would just like to acknowledge the financial contribution of uh, Terra Foundation for American Art, as well as our public partners, Government of Quebec, Canada Council for the Arts, and Conseil des Arts de Montréal. As you can see, we are using the webinar mode of uh, the Zoom platform right now. So uh, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them by using the Q&A button that is below your screen to write down your questions. I would invite you to write down your comments and questions throughout the presentation and not necessarily wait at the end. Whenever they pop in your mind, you can write it down and I will take after the main conversation with Mary and Lola uh, a couple of times to read aloud some of your questions for them to answer. So let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, so Laura, Laura Willey-Lac is a solo and Pocahontas uh, artist and designer who currently lives in Chiviwak, BC, her father's ancestral homeland. She attended Douglas College from 70 to 73 and majored in fine arts. In 73, she was accepted to the second uh, year ceramic program at the Vancouver School of Art, where she graduated with honors in ceramic in 77. It, from 79 to 81, she studied Northwest Coast design and carving with hereditary chief Tony Hunt in Victoria, BC. Um, Loha is a significant uh, Canadian ceramic artist and her original works has been exhibited locally, nationally and internationally since the 70s. Her work is represented in numerous museums and private and corporate collections, including MOA and was included in MOA's 2010 exhibition Border Zone, New Art Across Cultures. Loha has taught hand building and primitive firing workshops in colleges, universities, and art centers in Canada, the United States, China, Australia, and Italy. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Uh, Chief Curator of Montreal Museum of Fine Arts since 2020, Mary Deline Marais oversees a multidisciplinary team dedicated to enriching, promulgating, and preserving a collection of over 45,000 outworks and objects dating from antiquity to the present. She joined the museum in 2014 as she has published widely in uh, scholarly journals, exhibition catalogs, and art magazines on subjects ranging from impressionism to global modern and contemporary art. Originally from New York, she holds a PhD in art history from Yale, an MA from Lillian College, and a BA from Stanford. So now is the time uh, to pass it over to you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup, Benoît, et merci à vous tous et toutes qui sont ici avec nous aujourd'hui. Et surtout, uh, merci à, à Laura. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us here today. I really have to say it's such a pleasure to get to speak with you uh, during this lunch hour uh, here in Montreal. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to our discussion together. Um, I thought we could start uh, by talking about your name. Uh, it's an ancestral name and there's a beautiful story behind it. And I thought to hear you explain to the people that are with us today about uh, its roots and its meaning would be a nice way to introduce our conversation. 
Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say Aswell Mokwat, I'd like to say, which is good day, everyone, in my father's ancestral language. And um, it's just a pleasure to be here. And I, I just can't tell you what an honor it is to be included in this, this wonderful exhibition. And I really, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for including me. It's so rare that potters, quote unquote, potters, clay people get get into these kinds of wonderful exhibits. So I'm really, really happy and thank you very much. Um, my ancestral name is Lum Lamalut. And so uh, I go by many names. Laura Wheelick is my English name that I was uh, Wheelick. My ancestral name in the Hulk Milam language is Walayluk. And uh, when, um, uh, when no one could pronounce it, they changed it into English Wheelick. <laughs> and so that is my father's uh, name. That would be his first name. Names are funny. We they're very not like English. So, for example, we would just have one name. So my ancestral name is Loom Lamalut, and I was uh, bestowed that name a number of years ago. And it has a story that comes from Loom Lamalut actually existed about 250 years ago, and she uh, lived. Uh, here in the Chilliwack area where I currently live in my father's uh, ancestral territory. And she was one of two people who were born uh, as a twin, which was highly unusual for Indigenous people. I think it's unusual anyways uh, for all groups of people, mm -hmm. but for us, highly extraordinary. And um, so she, her, the first child, Walayluk V, it was his name, he was born on the banks of the Vedder River. And a month later, her mom, um, she popped out in the middle of a huge thunder and lightning storm where they say she, they were down at the banks of the Stalo, which is now called the Fraser River, and a, a, during a huge thunder and lightning storm. And she was very unexpected and out she popped. So her name, Lum Lamalut, actually means uh, loosely translated uh, traveling fast. Lam means to go and doubling it is uh, fasting or going fast, right? And um, and like I say, she lived about 250 years ago. So I carry her ancestral name. It's a yeah. beautiful, it's a beautiful story. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I thought it'd be interesting by way of introduction because, of course, um, your technique is uh, deeply rooted uh, in your uh, history and uh, heritage. So could you talk to us about how you came uh, to uh, working with clay and um, how you developed your particular technique of doing so? Well, you know, I started in high school. I, I took uh, art classes. The first time I ever touched clay was in high school. I had a wonderful uh, teacher, uh, an art teacher. And as soon as I uh, started working with it, I absolutely loved it. And I just knew that it would be in my life for the rest of my life. And, you know, I'm 70 now, 50 years later, I'm still working with clay and it's my closest companion. And I, um, yeah, I just continued on. And then I went on to art school and, and continued there. Yeah, so that's how I started was in high school. One of the things that distinguishes uh, the way that you uh, make your art is you use uh, firing with sawdust instead of uh, gas or electricity and a banding wheel instead of an electric wheel. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that choice? Sure. Uh, when I started in high school, I did try a uh, kick wheel. We only had kick wheels. We didn't have, I didn't, was inter wasn't introduced to a, uh, an electric wheel until I got to the art school. But, and I enjoyed the kick wheel, but I love the pace of hand building. I like the sound that it makes. I like the intimacy. It's not fast. I, I always found that uh, an electric wheel was just ferocious it had a ferocious appetite it was demanding and mm -hmm. I didn't like it and I I just preferred just doing things more methodically and uh and slowly and it, the, this t particular technique that I do hand building um is not uh indigenous to this part of the world uh, so it would be wood or baskets fibers and things that we would have normally worked with so uh, it's not so much that it's an indigenous 
to this area, but it's indigenous. Uh, most people around the world, of course, have used clay for, you know, everything from uh, containers to, you know, sculptures to beautiful, you know, beautiful, beautiful objects. So, yeah. So uh, my technique is uh, based based on that, just on the the intimacy that I'm able to uh, to gain by getting to know each clay body. I know that you have some objects around you. Do. Uh, do you want to maybe uh, show us uh, a few or one in particular and uh, talk to us about how you make it incredible? What I did was um, the, the geometry of space is something that's been reoccurring in my entire entire career, like way back into the 80s. And basically all I'm saying by using the word geometry is that the space geometry is basically about the relationship between points and and how it points to form basically or the surface and so my my whole thing with clay is first of all to honor the earth is my primary goal about working with clay i i just am so thankful to be here i'm so thankful and uh, to to get to just witness all this beauty that the earth has to offer. So my relationship with clay is directly trying to reflect that and honor that. And so during the course of my career, I I started to just make objects. And then uh, then it was let's make the object sit up in a certain way, which is clay is, you know, loves to just get flat when it's wet. And so mm -hmm. that was the first hurdle. But then once I got into making very simple, large olas or round, very round objects, which I can show you one of those in a second, I got into making pods and petals and started to realize over a course of time that my working with clay is really working with space and the relationship of, uh, you know, an object sitting within space and the internal space inside it. And then I became more involved with the negative space than the positive space, even though this is part of the process, right? And I think it's partly because it took 50 years of intimate working with the clay for that to reveal itself to me. So then I started to, you know, look more about the points in the relationship about how it was creating negative space and how important that was to my understanding of the totality of an object, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in this case, a, you know, a clay object, so. In that particular one, for example, maybe do you mind just lifting it up a little bit? Yes, further and center. Great. Now we see the whole object. Fantastic. How are you getting that color, which is really quite amazing? I mean, looking through a screen, you wouldn't even know that it's clay necessarily. It almost has the kind of could be metal, it looks like. How do you come to that color and patina? <laughs> Uh, so this is done by uh, a process called sawdust firing. And so what I do is I, after the piece is made, it's allowed to dry. And then it's bisque fire to a very low temperature, 017, because I burnish the surface with a smooth stone. And that's what gives it a patina. Mm -hmm. And then I put it into the electric kiln. And it just, it doesn't take very long just to 017 to... Uh, vitrify, not vitrify it, but uh, to get out most of the, the water, chemically combined water. And then I bring it out and then I put it into a sawdust fire chamber, which is outside, simple firebox, fill uh, the piece with sawdust to combination of hardwood and softwood and textures. And then I place sawdust around it and up above it. And then it slowly burns down over a day or two. And then this is what is uh, what comes out. And the, one of the reasons I love this process is because you never, ever know what it's going to look like ever. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything to predict the surface quality. And so I get all these really magical things happening on it, right? Different textures. Sometimes it can be completely dark. Like this one's very dark for the most part, but I'll just step out of the screen for a second, show you a different color. And sometimes you get these rainbowing, rainbowing effects. And of course the color of the clay, for example. Oh, that's one, beautiful. This one here just came out of the kiln a couple of days ago. And what I'm doing is I'm testing clay bodies for color, uh, different clay bodies, just to see this one here is the Navajo wheel. And so you can see it's very orange 
uh, in, the, in the spots that aren't covered with the surface of sawdust, uh, smoldering. Beautiful. Good. But it, and look at how shiny it is. It looks as if it has a glaze on it, but there's no glazes. It's just burnishing with a smooth stone and, uh, and then uh, it polishes the surface. And so you can see it has these little things on it that are like rainbowing effects. It's got these beautiful patterns that are totally, I never know what the heck's going to come out. And that's what I love about it is that it's so unpredictable. It's not like, okay, I'm going to use a green glaze. It's going to come out green. It's just, oh my goodness, look what's there now. So I'm always interested and excited, right, about what, what is going to be on the surface of it. It seems like there's a kind of alchemy to it, you know. This, Absolutely, yeah. This Absolutely. magic that um, this magic that comes out. Now, is that an example of the form you mentioned called Ola? Uh, no, an Ola is a more. I'll show you another one that uh, uh, that just came out with this particular fire, and um, this would be a more classic shape. I'll I'll go back a little bit so you can kind of see the form, and so an Ola is. Uh, has been made, it's a universal shape. And basically an Ola, it's a Spanish word for, uh, I believe a container. And they generally were used to, to contain water. And uh, so they're water vessels. And so, and quite often you might see them say, uh, carried on people's on the heads. Head. Yeah. And so uh, the reason that they were used, this kind of method was used was because in hot climates, when it's filled with the water and when the water seeps through it because it's still porous it evaporates and it keeps the water inside cool there's a, it's like a natural cooling agent so that's one of the reasons that it was used other than the fact that it contained you know it carried a lot of water it was able to carry a lot of water in it so this is a more classic ola or a shape that i started out making and then i branched out into pods petals, petals unfurling, and got more sculptural uh, uh, out of this form. It's kind of like, you know, how uh, throwers, they start with a cylinder, learn how to make a cylinder, right, right, right. and then span out from there. And that's what I did. This was like my cylinder uh, and my basic shape. And then I started to become more sculptural with it. And well, are you always using the same wheel? You mentioned the Navajo wheel when you were talking about the uh, more orange colored um, object. Are you always using the same wheel no matter what kind of forms you're making or you change wheels? Well, the Navajo wheel I referred to was a clay body actually called Navajo wheel. Oh, the, it's the clay the body. Color. That's why. Okay. that's I didn't know that. No, that's that's okay. It's um, the but the a banding wheel that I use is just a wheel that you turn by hand, and also I use a puki, which is just a simple clay base that I will set the bottom in when I'm working, so that it doesn't get really really flattened out and it keeps its shape a bit better because it's made out of clay. It absorbs some of the moisture in the clay mm -hmm. bottom. So. Um, I do uh, uh, use those two primarily in my making of uh, of all my work. Fantastic. It's so anyway. I, I love even in the three objects that you've shown today, the mm -hmm. differences in the color and um, forms are, are really kind of um, mind blowing and um, somehow calming also. I don't know if that's something in your mind, but it yeah, has a calming effect even when I look at it through the Zoom screen. They are extremely calming. And I've had people, who, some of uh, people who purchase my work have uh, uh, called me and said, you know what, I love your work in the middle of the night. If I can't sleep, I'll go sit. It's on the dining room table in the living room. And in the dimness, I sit there, I look at it, and it calms me. And mm -hmm. so you're not, you're right. They are extremely calming and they're very smooth. They're really, really smooth. So to hold them, they're lovely to hold as well. Mm. And all of this simple process, right? They're very, very warm and kind of loving. You just want to kind of like hold on. <laughs> well, but, it's so, I'm jealous because from the museum standpoint, you know, we're like, don't touch, don't touch. And so <laughs> it's wonderful to see you interacting with your objects in that way. Yeah, these are definitely meant to hold and they're definitely meant to live with. And uh, uh, they are really lovely objects. And it's not, you know, my my relationship with them is all about 
giving it back to the earth to have the final statement. So it's a way of inviting, as you mentioned earlier, the word ethereal, the ethereal world to paint a picture about what's going on out there. And that's how I look at the surface qualities of them. And sometimes I get pictures of uh, birds and whales and ravens, you know, all kinds of beautiful images, people, spirits come out through the, the surface quality. So there's another magical level to it and it's nothing that I've done or of I've determined right and that's what makes it so really special for me to be able to see that and sometimes they're very o ominous like there's stories mm -hmm. like uh the first time I was invited to the southwest to have an exhibit the last piece that came out had a woman sitting um it was sort of a you know a, a very vague image of a woman sitting tending a fire, it looked like, with a mesa behind her. And I'd never been to the Southwest. I didn't know what mesas were yet. And when I got down there, that's exactly what it looked like. Oh, it was, there was mesas and people, and I don't ever say anything. I don't say, oh, go look at that, right? I see that. I don't tell people what I see. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I set it on the table, Mama kind of said, she, she came into the room and she said, there's a woman sitting on there. And so there, these are images that other people can see as well. And so, and it was a bit, you know, uh, prophetic, right? About yes. what, what was, and when I first moved to Hawaii and my first piece that I uh, fired there had a huge volcano on it. That's amazing. I yeah. mean, there's real magic there. Is that kind of when you meant, I, I, uh, uh, read you uh, somewhere saying that you like to have the elements of nature have the final say in your work. I feel that sort of resonates to me through what you're saying now. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not the only one that sees them. People, they they see them too, right? And so to me, that was like, oh, what a great welcome. I'm in the land of volcanoes. And the first piece is like this That's huge so this volcano exploding, right? And it's like, wonderful so yeah that's fantastic I'd like us to go if we could I was just going to share um, my screen because yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit specifically about the uh, work that we have of yours uh, in the exhibition let me see if okay. I'm technologically uh, savvy enough to uh, make this happen cross fingers uh, is this a good yeah. image of people seeing this um, yes okay yeah. great so this is geometry of space uh, two. Let me see if I can do this. So you're not seeing these. Uh, there we go. Um, maybe you could talk specifically about um, this object. Okay. Well, this one here was. Uh, I just made it a few years ago, and um, again, I'm looking at this interplay between positive and negative space. And uh, I've done several pieces that are in the Geometry of Space series, and most of them have been black, but I thought, no, I'm going to start doing some just white, not sawdust firing them. So this one uh, was the first one that was done that wasn't made uh, or put into the sawdust fire. And how I make these, and th this is a long process, right? And it's a precarious process. So when I, I had to do a maquette or a, a smaller one, which was, which is this one here. And so to work out, oh. my, I, to work out my, this one here is, uh, you can see it's not that big compared to that one. It's about a, a, a half the size for sure. And I started by um, making just a simple round shape and then pulling the piece out and adding vertical coils on the inside and pulling them out and then on the outside and sculpting them on to the piece. And so then afterwards, uh, I, of course, I, I sculpt them with tools and things like that. But at that point, but, you know, this probably took me a week to make. And so uh, because it's precarious and it has to be just the right uh, amount of moisture in it, if it's too wet, the tops are going to fall in. And then uh, when I'm cutting them, I have to be very careful when I'm smoothing them and burnishing them and getting into these little tight areas, I can mm -hmm. twang them off at any time. So I could technically, the whole thing could change in a split second, right? Then I would have to readjust everything, I guess. But but that's how they're made. They're made with these vertical coils. 
the other thing about my working with coils is they're not your typical round coils where you when we were in high school we were taught to make round coils and put them on top of one another mm -hmm. right and then kind of like glue them together that's not how i work i make bands of clay to make the first object or the round shape before I start branching out. So it's a stronger shape to work with. And my clay is really stiff when I work with it as well. It's not soft. If it's too stiff or too soft, it just wants to sag everywhere. And I can't get this mm -hmm. really crisp shape, right? And when you're cutting, I mean, what what is the shape of the, the tool? I mean, I know you must have a, a million tools, but is there one that is your your favorite. I'm just wondering how you physically get get in there because, as you said, it's this precarious process. It could all collapse. Yeah, I have a feddling knife, and a feddling knife is just simply um, it has like a little wooden handle, and then it's very thin, and it goes to a very thin point, and it's really really sharp. And so yeah. the the tricky part about it is the cut because. If you cut and you come down too hard in one of the areas here, you're going to cause a crack probably to develop later throughout the firing. So I always make sure that I do a nice little round area here and then cut upwards. And I never cut down because it's too easy to slip and to cause more cracking in this area. But um, a fettling knife is what I use to cut. And it's always the same one that I use. Yeah. So uh, I do have a lot of different tools to, to use, but that's the one for cutting, for sure. Mm. Mm. Do you have um, a favorite piece that you've made? Oh, gee, do I have a favorite piece? I I don't think I do. They're all so different. I, I certainly have pieces that are like, you know, the biggest pieces that I've done are three feet by two and a half feet wide. So they're not, well, they're not my favorite. They're the biggest pieces that I made. So they stand out for that reason, because mm -hmm. I was rolling out six feet long coiled uh, pieces, uh, coils of clay, and then attaching them singly around these large objects. And so for me, it was a huge accomplishment. This is years ago. I probably couldn't do it now. I'm not quite strong enough to do that. When you're a kid, right? You're strong. Yes, and you yes, it. yes. But at this point, it's like six foot long uh, coils. No, no, no. But uh, so I don't have a real, I don't have a favorite. I have ones though that are like, accomplishments like holy smokes how did I do that and I go whoa it, so like this one here the first one that I showed you that was for me it was a it was a tricky piece or the one that you have was also really a tricky piece and my my sort of thing was like can I get from here bigger like and that so I have these uh, challenges and then when I do I go wow I actually did it so yeah. maybe the saying is they're all my favorite for a time until the next because <laughs> because definitely it's like oh geez how did I do that right because I usually am quite stunned myself when I do these pieces but yeah. I can. yeah yeah that's a, that's a, amazing I'd, I'd love for you to talk about um how teaching has um uh, in, in, impacted your practice and, and why that's important to you. You've been a teacher for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps you could talk about that role that you also play. Uh, yeah, I started teaching when I was 17 uh, at, our, you know, like community centers and things like that. And then I branched out and I started to teach uh, for the art school for a little bit. Then I started teaching internationally. And I absolutely love teaching. Teaching is just uh, my career in teaching is not what it was, you know, because I'm 70 and I'm kind of in a retirement, you know, I'm in a retirement mode. But I still do teach at uh, some workshops, and I love it. Uh, teaching is, um, it's, you know, you get so much back from people, you know, when you're working with people. And it's just, uh, it's wonderful to watch people accomplish something that they're setting out to accomplish and you're guiding them to do that. And when they do it, they're just so pleased. And it's just so wonderful to watch that take place it's like a blossoming flower right where you just you try and yeah. find them, all of a sudden it opens up and then it's like oh look at that and then they go for it and I have I also do a lot of mentoring I still have 
probably have about people that I'm 10 people that I'm mentoring at this point. And a mentor mentoring is different than teaching. It's sort of like being a guide and they're there throughout their career. Like, okay, I'm going to do this. Can you help me with that? I'm not sure how to approach there. So I do a lot of mentoring, more mentoring now than I did as the actual teaching part of the mm. constructing of clay. So it's about things like, uh, you know, I'm working on this. I'm not sure. Should I show it this way? You know, so it's more technical stuff just around the world of pottery within the art world, right? And how to mm -hmm. maneuver your way through that. Um, but yeah, teaching has been a huge, big part of my career. And I haven't, um, let's see, uh, I'm just trying to think of the last, uh, the last time I did a long period of teaching. It's been a while. Uh, but I mostly do workshops as well, if I'm going to do uh, do teaching, mm. as well, which is fun. So groups of people, small groups of people, 12 to 15 people. What has been the most important thing for you, if there's just one, um, to pass on as an educator? To be a, a, a resource guide. Mm. That you, you can't really teach people anything. What you have, what, you know, what I'm there for is to be a resource and to listen carefully as to what people's needs are and go, ah, I know mm -hmm. something that might help you with that, right? So it's not uh, being, being a, a good teacher is actually listening to what people are wanting. And the great gift about, for me, teaching is that, that Sometimes you're able to make things easier for people so that they can advance quicker to where they want to go to get mm -hmm. to their goal, right? So that's mm -hmm. a really gratifying gift back from teaching to be helpful, right? Mm. Um, I'd like to go back maybe as a last question before we open it up to um, questions from our audience to uh, something you said about um, navigating your the way through uh, in the art world as somebody who works uh, in clay in pottery. And I know that for you, it's important that your work is defined as uh, design uh, rather than craft, which is um, important, you know, I think, well, also when I look at it in the context of this exhibition, where what we're really trying to do is provide a kind of expanded concept of design. So for so many women for so long, uh, the very interesting and important work that they were doing uh, was overlooked or uh, not considered as design. And I'm wondering if you can maybe just talk about your own uh, personal experience in terms of navigating your own way uh, through the art and, and, and design world and kind of staking a place for yourself, which you've done uh, so successfully, but I imagine encountered a lot of um, obstacles in the way toward doing so yourself. Yeah. Well, the, the first hurdle with, um, with clay is that it's always been classified as a uh, craft. Yeah. Right. There, these we have these we have these uh, words, right? That uh, it's craft. And so, um, for example, one time I was showing at a at a gallery in Vancouver, and you know I was doing my PR and stuff like that. And I called up people. I said, "Do you know about this show? This is happening." And I called the local newspaper, and they said, "Oh, we we don't review craft, but right?" Yeah. And I went, "Oh." Okay, thanks very much. And then I was interviewed by CBC Radio, and I said, "Did you know that our newspaper doesn't 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 whatever?" So I advocated for the fact that these guys are saying they're classifying it as craft. It's not fine art. And here I am. I look at my work. It looks to me like it's pretty fine. It's not, you know, a <laughs> cup that I'm going to like drink out of, and then, you know, whatever. And so. Uh, so anyway, the next the next day they they called and they said we're co we're coming to review that show. So so there has always been these hurdles and even like I have to tell you when you sent out an invitation to me to be in this show Women in Design, I thought I finally made it. It only took fifty years for someone <laughs> to realize what I was doing. Uh, my work is really about design. Right. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. how I am working with clay. It's not about the clay is the medium. It's not mm -hmm. really about if you look at it carefully and you you try and sort through the 
the, the intellect to, to get it to that point. It's really about a, a thing between positive and negative space. And how do you point to that? By good design, right? Mm -hmm. And whether mm -hmm. it's a pure form or whether it's a very intricate form that's capturing the negative space in an interesting way. So, so I thought, whoa, this is so great. Like that was the biggest gift to me out of 50 years was that, you see, and then I realized, I think I finally made it, you know, if there's to be made anywhere, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Because Clay, how often does Clay get into a show, not only the history of women in design, but, you know, uh, in design period, it's never classified as design. Well, I'm so happy that this exhibition, participating in this exhibition has meant so much to you. Um, uh -huh. It's really wonderful to hear you say this uh, in person or as more or less in person. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very moved by that, by that uh, testimony. And for us, it's really an honor to have your work in the show, which I encourage uh, everybody to go and see because it's really fantastic and a highlight of the last section of the exhibition. Um, thank you so much, Laura, for your time today. I really enjoyed speaking with you. I know that Benoit wanted to leave some time uh, for questions uh, mm -hmm. of the others, so I'll, I'll let him uh, handle that part. But I just want to say thanks for sharing your, your time, your energy, and your insight with me this afternoon. Thank you. I thank you. I really appreciate it. It's lovely meeting you too, Mary Daly. Right. Yes. So Bye. Laura, if you would allow it, we would have time maybe for two questions. Okay. We have um, Esther Rosenberg uh, writing to you. Yeah. Uh, she writes, um, I know your series Geometry of Space is incredibly fragile, and I understand that you can have a high casualty rate given that fragility. I know you invest a lot in creating a piece, so how do you deal with a loss of a piece? Well, um, that's a really good question. Thanks for your question, Esther. I... I don't really ever lose a piece because I have an area of my work called the cracked collection. And, and, and so, because to me, the cracks are part of this kind of firing process. So I don't see them as a negative per se. You know how most people go, it's cracked, it's terrible, I don't want it. But I go, no, it's cracked because I'm pushing the boundaries of what I'm doing and it's teaching me about those boundaries. And so I value it just as much as as any other piece. So yeah, I, I don't see cracking as a negative. I see it as like, oh, okay, it cracked. I'm learning from that. And I do have an area of my work that's called the crack collection. So yeah. I love that. And I can hear also the teaching experiences that <laughs> in that knowing yeah. how to, to make mistakes and learn from them, I think that's is right. Like, yeah. Yeah, everything is connected. Um, Catherine Lenos also uh, writes to you. Thank you for sharing your practice with us, Laura. It sounds like the material, the clay body, has a lot to say over the final form your pieces take. Mm -hmm. Do you sometimes find that your material is pushing back against a form you are trying to coax out of it? Mm -hmm. Are there pieces or shapes you have tried to make that the clay would not confirm to it? Sure. Yeah. Clay is everything. And clay, each, you know, the thing that I've learned over the last 50 years is every clay body has its own personality. And some clay bodies just resist. Like, for example, porcelain is really difficult to work with in this kind of a way because it has a memory and it always wants to go back to the way it began. So, yeah, clay, uh, your clay body, I do have resistance with clay and I go, OK, and, and it's not only the making of the object, but it's also the burnishing of it. So if there's too much grog in it, it ends up scratching the surface. Some clay bodies are duller than others. I don't get the gloss that I like, although sometimes I like them to be that way for particular reasons. But yes, clay has a huge um, is hugely important, right, in, in what you're trying to convey. And some of them are just uh, kind of unruly. And so you just have to experiment with clays that feel comfortable for you to get to where you want to go. 
Mm, it's almost a co-creation. <laughs> yeah, yo, absolutely. It has its own say, just as the elements do. That's why I love working this way. It's like, you know, there's there's so, lots of levels that I'm giving it up to, like the clay, you learn about the clay or the final patterning. At the end, it's it's nature who's who's having the final statement. And I just love that. Well, thank you, Laura, again for uh, the for your generosity. It's been really a pleasure to uh, hear you talking about your work. Thank you, Mary, for hosting this conversation. It's really appreciated. And uh, well, thanks also to our viewers. Uh, this uh, session is recorded, so it will be uh, available online afterwards for other people to uh, listen to it. So thanks a lot and have a good thank you.